So I've entitled my talk, <coughs> Oxygen, a Prescribing Blind Spot. And for those of you who use the national medication chart, uh, for all its good aspects, there is a blind spot, or at least one, and this is it. So I'm going to talk about three patients, <coughs> and I presented this to our, um, our department about four weeks ago um, when I presented one patient. And within the um, month, well, this last month, when we looked at our m and our deaths from uh, two months ago, I now have three patients. Um, so that might indicate that this is more of a problem than I had uh, previously known. Uh, so this, these are three patients, and all in our service, all in the last three months, and unfortunately all had the same outcome. All of these patients had severe COPD. So like Mike says, in hospital we're not dealing with well people, we're dealing with sick people. And we have to be very careful with some of these people. Um, they came in this winter with an exacerbation of COPD. Uh, none of these people were prescribed oxygen, and they all died um, from what we call hyperoxic hypercapnia, so too much oxygen, too much CO2. So the first patient was Ms. Ms. J, who was a well woman. Um, and looking back in her history, um, she had come to our hospital five years ago and had been at that stage admitted to ICU because she had been put on oxygen for a COPD exacerbation. She didn't do very well on the oxygen um, and so she was put on bi-level non-invasive ventilation uh, and like many patients she couldn't tolerate that and she had a very high CO2 and was quite narcos, was transferred to ICU and was intubated. Um, so she was in ICU ventilated for 12 days. This is a long, long time uh, to be ventilated in ICU. And it took, um, took that long to get her off her ventilation. And when ICU discharged her, they noted clearly on the notes that she was a CO2 retainer. Um, and that the caution had to be taken when, if she were to be admitted to hospital again. So she came into our hospital earlier this year and that all went okay, but she came back again in August, and when she was admitted, her old notes seemingly were not looked at. And one of the points I took from your talk was this economic laziness, where doing things, um, cutting corners I suppose would be one way of putting it, but doing things that are most of the time okay, a quick taking the quick route, but they're not always okay, and on this occasion it was not okay. Um, the person admitting her did not look at the old notes, or they would have identified easily that she'd had a problem with oxygen before. Um, there was no management plan on admission for her oxygen therapy, and oxygen was not, char not charted on the national medication chart. She was just admitted. I'm not going to go through these in detail, because this slide, as I mentioned, was um, for our group, but, and I don't want to get bogged down in detail. But you can see here in 2012, there's all these, this is really nicely written. So we've got how much oxygen, what her CO2 was, and all of this, this detail is there. Um, a stands for arterial blood gas. Um, the trial of BiPAP didn't work, went to ICU. So then she came back, and five years later she came back, and you can see that things were not written down uh, as carefully. So we don't know how much oxygen she got, we don't know what sort of blood gas was taken, um, and it's not altogether useful. However, she did make it out of hospital alive on that occasion. <clears throat> so this is directly copied from her final admission, and you don't need to read right through it, but this is the plan here down the bottom. So it's, it's quite a detailed plan from the admitting registrar, um, but the thing that's missing there, amongst all the stuff that probably didn't even need to be done, was an oxygen plan. There was nothing, there's no mention. So what ended up happening was this, nothing basically. So that's, um, this is a copy of her chart. I've clearly blanked out her name. Um, but under oxygen therapy and medical gases, there's nothing. There's no target saturations, there's no prescription of oxygen, there's just nothing. And this went unnoticed for the few days that she was in the ward until one night. We can see here, you can see where it says RA up there, that's room air. So that's her not receiving any oxygen at all. She's just breathing in the room air in hospital. And you can see her saturations, are they're absolutely fine. They're between 90, 92. Um, so things were all going well until um, one night when suddenly pops up there two litres of oxygen. 
you see that second to last one there, it says two litres, 95, and two litres, 97. So somehow she was, she was started on oxygen. It still wasn't prescribed, because you can see the prescription chart, there's nothing written on there at all. Um, and so what happened with this woman is that she, it's quite a long and not a very pleasant story, but she had a seizure um, because of the high CO2. Um, she was declined for ICU because they'd previously said that they wouldn't have her back because they couldn't wean her last time, and she had a hypoxic brain injury and died. It was a, it was a pretty sad story. Um, and then, so subsequent to that, we had Mr. H, and Mr. H was a 68-year-old man, again with severe COPD. Um, he was different to Ms. J in that no one knew he was a CO2 retainer, and he was admitted again. It's winter time. Every second person has an exacerbation of COPD. Again, there was no plan for oxygen management on his chart, on his admission plan, and there was also uh, oxygen was not charted. So one early morning, um, around about the changeover of nursing staff and before the day shift of doctors had come on in the hospital, Mr. H desaturated into his 60s, into the 60s, and um, the nurses caring for him popped a Hudson mask on and began to put 10 litres of oxygen um, through it, uh, which is a lot of oxygen. Uh, the register, they called the, um, the doctors who were arriving for the day and the registrar went straight up and said, take that off, it's too much oxygen. Um, and so they took the mask off and the patient again desaturated and the, new, the mask was put back on the patient with 10 litres going through. Uh, unfortunately, by that time, um, Mr. H had become very drowsy and quite agitated and confused. And when they tried to put him on BiPAP, uh, he was combative and took the BiPAP off. Uh, unfortunately, he developed type 2 respiratory failure and subsequently died from that. And then we've got Miss, Ms, Mrs. N, sorry, who's a 73-year-old lady. Now, she has severe COPD. She was on home oxygen. And at home, her max, maximum exercise tolerance was getting out of bed and being helped to the toilet. So she was not a well woman. Um, she had been in hospital before and it noted that she had CO2 retention. And so the registrar on this occasion did go through the old notes, noted that she had CO2 retention previously, and uh, wrote in her plan that uh, she could have oxygen up to two liters a minute, which should have been fine for this woman, but it wasn't charted. And so Mrs. N uh, developed uh, low sats and hypoxia on the ward and was put on four to six litres of oxygen via nasal prong. There was no oxygen charted at all. Um, and she became, again, very sedated. Um, nobody seemed to be able to figure out why she was so sedated. She continued to receive the oxygen. Um, and she probably died of aspiration pneumonia. We think while she was sedated, she aspirated and then died. So these were three cases that occurred within the last couple of months in our DHB, and I have no doubt that these are happening elsewhere as well. The signs of hypercapnia were missed, um, and some of these signs are not subtle. So patients sedated, well, that can happen in a hospital through many different reasons. But typically, if the person is receiving oxygen and they become sedated, the probable cause of that is CO2 retention. They get very vasodilated, so they become red and hot. Um, and have a bounding pulse, and asterixis seemed to be a sign that most people did not even realise was associated with CO2 retention. So I'm going to pop, go through this slide quite quickly. Um, we used to use um, arterial blood gases, where you'd put a needle into the patient's artery, which could be quite painful if you weren't very good at it, um, but it, it gave you a result of exactly what was happening in the patient's blood. Um, now the tendency is to use venous blood gases, which can be taken just from a, um, an ordinary old you know, blood drawing of blood from the vein there. And the result is not the same. It's, you have to interpret it correctly. Um, and the key thing up here is the carbon dioxide. So if the patient has a carbon dioxide less than 46, it's fine, it's normal, nothing else needs to be done. If it's greater than 46, we know it's not normal, but we don't know what it is. So at that stage, then the person needs to go on and do an arterial blood gas, but the registrars are de-skilled at that because nobody does them anymore because they're too painful. Um, so it's not happening. We're not getting a clearer picture of exactly where the patient is. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, a problem that's led on from um, patients 
people wanting to improve patient care, but actually making it worse. So in our hospital, we have a thing called the PML. It's a 3DHB uh, hut where up in Wellington. We all share the same guidance. And what it clearly says up here is that oxygen must be charted on the patient's medication chart. Um, I was speaking to Alan before who told me that this was audited, I think he said, at Counties Manukau, and they found out that 12% of their patients had, who were on oxygen had it charted on the chart. And my, I think that if we'd done that same audit at our hospital, we would find it was 0%. <clears throat> Perhaps a few more now. So what we should be doing for patients with COPD is charting the target. So that's the very bare minimum we can do, is make sure that the patient only gets oxygen so they're at a target between 88 and 92%. Um, and what we found was that um, some of the nursing staff were thinking that they were doing the right thing by making the targets up around 95 to 100%. It's not appropriate in COPD, it's not helpful, and it's not safe. So the other target up there is for patients with asthma who don't have the same issues, and you can aim for much higher with those patients, largely don't have the same issues. Uh, otherwise, this is what I've taken to doing, is <clears throat> do not administer oxygen unless discussed with senior medical staff. But obviously, if it's an emergency, then the nurses have to act. Um, but we just don't want them popping on 10 litres of oxygen. So these are the different devices. Again, you don't have to study this too closely. Um, but when I was a registrar, which is now 15 years ago, <clears throat> we used to use that thing there, the Venturi mask. Um, and that's the only device, really, that when you pop it on patients, there's no risk of CO2 retention. And unbeknownst to me, this was not really in use anymore. I remember running around the hospital trying to find the correct one. They used to come in six different colours, and you could never find the right colour when you wanted it. Uh, oh, I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, but that has all changed. So what was happening now is that most of the time people were just getting nasal pro-oxygen. And there was, when I spoke to the, the nurses and some of the medical staff, they said, oh, the patients don't like masks. They don't like the full face mask, um, which I have no doubt is true. Um, but they also probably don't like six litres of oxygen going up their nose either. So this was happening here, the nasal prongs, the Hudson mask, um, was also out of fashion. The Venturi masks seemed to have all but disappeared, uh, and then people weren't normally using the rebreather, thankfully. So the lessons that we needed to learn from this was that carbon dioxide retention can occur to any COPD patient. There's no such thing as a retainer and a non-retainer. Any patient can retain COP, uh, CO2 with, when they've got COPD, especially as the, the disease gets worse. And it must be written on their problem list. There's not much point in this. The first patient there, I, I, um, when I gave this talk to our department, I, I put up her problem list. And it was all this minutiae, all this rubbish that was completely irrelevant. But the one thing that counted was left off the problem list. Um, the oxygen therapy must be part of the plan. When the patient goes to the ward, people do read the plan. But if it's not on there, what to do with the oxygen, then they're not going to know what to do must be prescribed oxygen, supplemental oxygen is a drug. This oxygen, obviously, not a drug, but if we're giving supplemental oxygen, it's a drug. Uh, and from what I've seen recently, it is more dangerous than many of the drugs that we use, although we don't have hydromorphone. The signs of CO2 retention, nobody seemed to have much of a clue about. Uh, it is fairly obvious when you go up to patients who've got CO2 retention, but that seemed to have been something that people just wasn't on people's radar. VBGs, that's a whole new talk in itself, and Venturi masks are under you. So Venturi masks are the safe one. That's our safety net. And when I spoke to our charge nurses, we have three medical wards, Wellington Hospital, and one of them did have Venturi wards, the other two didn't. Um, and the nursing staff on our on medical wards are mostly younger nurses, and a lot of them are inexperienced, and they don't remember when we used to routinely use a Venturi mask. So in conclusion, this is the old, these are the old Venturi masks. And for anyone here who's of my vintage, um, you, each one of those colours related to a different amount of oxygen that went through it. So you can see numbers on there, the white one, 35, the red one, 40, the blue one, which is the one we mostly use, 28. And they've all got different numbers. So if you wanted the patient to have 28 or 40% or whatever, you had to run around the hospital and find the right colour. Um, and they were never, ever where you wanted them. And I think that's why they went out of favour. Uh, this, this is what one of our 
our charge nurse tells me. But the newer version, just you just click it round. So it's, you don't have all these different colors. It's just one mask, and it's got a little thing that goes click, click, click. So it's a forcing function. Um, you can't not set it. You can't just leave the thing open for oxygen to flow through. You have to choose an amount of oxygen to go through it. So um, that's a winner, I think. And now, as a result of these cases, all three of our wards uh, have the Venturi masks there again. So old technology, gone. New technology, great. Um, but if we could have a forcing function to make people prescribe oxygen on the national medication chart, um, that would be wonderful as well.